Fiora. <laughs> My story starts here. After a long and difficult job search, I had finally landed a job at a seminal human-centered design firm. That's me in the chair on the right. Here I got the chance to work with brilliant researchers, designers, and developers. I got thrown into the really deep end of the pool. I was leading big projects and solving wicked problems. But after a year of working 50 and 60 hour work weeks, I looked like this. I spent every Saturday in bed and every Sunday working. I was burnt out and I needed to get out, but I didn't know where to go next. And then I got this magical email from someone in my network asking if I wanted to come down to Uganda and help build mobile financial services for the poor. At the time, I was single, I didn't have a mortgage, a cat, a house plant. I applied, interviewed, got an offer. Shamefully at the time, this was the extent of my geographic knowledge of Africa. <laughs> I couldn't place Uganda on a map. For the record, it's right here. With three weeks notice, I put my things in storage, packed my bags, got a lot of immunizations, hopped on this plane, and ultimately arrived here in Kampala, Uganda. This is the produce market in the city center. Before I dig into talking about the work I was doing, I'd really like to take you on a photographic tour of the people and place so that you can understand the context of use. Life in Uganda is youthful, vibrant, and social. This is a jandal shop in the city center. The city center itself is walkable, although there are some surprises to be found along the sidewalk. These are Matatu's private minibuses, so they function much like city buses where you can hop on and then shout out when you want to get off. These are boda bodas, motorcycle taxis, and so you can pick one and hop on, they'll take you where you want to go. If you find a driver that you especially like, then you can um, keep their number and call them and they'll come pick you up wherever you are. The custom on the boda is that you don't hang on to the driver. Some families have their own bodas. Boda carrying a boda. <laughs> <laughs> and these are the original boda bodas. And if you go out to the village, instead of motorcycles, you can hire a ride on a bicycle and you sit on that cushion right there. And so the custom here is that the women are wearing a dress or a skirt. And so they'll sit side saddle and the men will sit facing forward like this man here. A fabric stall at the market. Okay, this is a dress for a big traditional ceremony called a gomesi, and it has this big belt made out of really slippery material, and it takes a certain skill to tie the knot so that it doesn't slip out while you're wearing it. This image is from a colleague's wedding, and here we're carrying gifts to the lucky couple. A look at what the men wear. You can see the groom in the middle beaming. In the year I was living there, both Beyonce and miniskirts were outlawed. And now a look into the village life. In this context, the word hotel on that building means a place to get something to eat. Through the good work of some NGOs, there are water pumps, hand pumps out in the rural villages. The kids line up with their jerry cans and take turns pumping and then carry the water back home. These men are sitting around a bucket of waraji, which is a type of local gin, and so you can see they each have a long straw. They offered me a sip, but I didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a look at commercial waraji. It's clear, and in the office we used it for cleaning our whiteboards. <laughs> okay, this is a look at a very deluxe meal for a big celebration. And in this culture, carbohydrates are considered the most important part of the meal. And because of that, carbs are the only thing called food. So in this image, the rice, squash, millet, sweet potato, matoke, processed maize, and Irish potato are all food. And those other items are not called food. Cassava is a root vegetable which must be processed in order to be edible. And these women have a business milling the cassava, and so that's what that white powder is on them. 
Does anyone recognize this? This is a business, and so this woman is processing grasshoppers. She's taking off their wings and legs. Next, they get cooked with some onions and a bit of spices. It tastes pretty good. The texture is not dissimilar to shrimp. These are eggs for sale in the market wrapped in former homework. <laughs> A look at a produce stand in a rural area. You can see some pumpkins in the lower left side of the screen, and those are bowls of tomatoes on the table. And then a wicked storm brewing in the distance. A butcher stall at the market. These are cow parts. Uh, so much like we may have rest stops along the highway here at Crossroads, uh, there were vendors that would come to you selling meat on a stick or different snacks some bananas and chickens in transit. And for some reason, toothpaste comes with kiwi shoe polish. <laughs> Kiwis really cornered the market on shoe polish. <laughs> A man with leopard fur shoes. Now we're getting back into the city center, and this is an educational mural letting you know that when you vote, your thumb will be marked with a permanent marker. When I got homesick, I would go to a Japanese restaurant around the corner from our office and get sushi. And so here I've brought back some sushi, and I'm giving my colleague a taste for the first time. I think you... <laughs> <laughs> He didn't understand why I would eat that. <laughs> OK, now let's talk about the work. Grameen Foundation's mission is to enable the poor, especially women, to create a world without poverty or hunger. Here we're looking at Grameen Foundation's Kampala office, and specifically at the App Lab team. That's who hired me. App Lab is a mobile money innovation lab. Uganda itself has a big shortage of branch banks and ATMs. According to the World Bank, Australia has, for every 100,000 people, Australia has 146 ATMs, New Zealand 64, and Uganda just four. This is a look at my product team from left to right, myself, a relationship manager, translator, business analyst, developer, and coordinator. I found my colleagues in my new office dress much nicer than my colleagues back home, <laughs> including some really amazing ties. <laughs> and this is the phone we were designing for, a simple phone, brand new, it costs 20 US dollars. Usually one family will have a phone that they share amongst them. If their phone breaks and they don't have money for a phone, they'll likely still own a SIM card with a phone number and then borrow their friend's or neighbor's phone and pop it in. And it's much easier to swap SIM cards in these phones than our smartphones. Minutes, airtime minutes are bought on demand through scratch cards like these. You can also buy airtime minutes through mobile money. And this is mobile money. Can I see a show of hands? How many people know what mobile money is? A sprinkling of people. How many people know what PayPal or Venmo is? OK, almost everyone. So mobile money works a lot like PayPal or Venmo. And it works for people that don't have credit cards or bank accounts using these simple phones. Before mobile money existed, people in East Africa were using their phones to transfer airtime to each other to pay for goods and services. And then observing this behavior and building off of it, a team of researchers created a new service called M-Pesa, which introduced this idea of being able to cash out those airtime minutes. And thus, mobile money was born. Today, mobile money has 690 million active users worldwide. The industry is processing, on average, a billion US dollars a day. The average customer moves $188 a month. And this is a look at a mobile money agent in a very rural area. So she has a bench, a logbook, a phone, and some cash. And so now I can go to her with my 20 shillings, 20,000 shillings, I mean, and ask her, can, can you send this to my sister who's across country? And so uh, she'll take my money um, and then send that money to my sister. She, my sister will get a text. She can go to her agent and then uh, withdraw that money minus some fees. 
Or I can ask the agent to put that money onto my account. And maybe that's my SIM card primarily in my phone, or maybe it's a secret second SIM card that I can then take and put somewhere that no one else knows about. This is an agent in a slightly less rural area. He's got a branded desk and a kiosk. And a look at an agent in a bigger village. So her kiosk is inside of a store selling phones and chargers. And this is the kind of screen we were designing for. It just scrolls up and down and forward and back. It's menus only. Now, a very few of the bigger villages have branch banks. And when you arrive at a branch bank, you're greeted with a guard with a really big gun. In order to feel comfortable even going inside the bank, you would be expected to wear nice clothes as if you were going to church or temple. Once inside the bank, you'd be confronted with forms and instructions that you might not be able to read, either because you didn't get that education or because they're not in your local language. And so because of this, people rely on informal mechanisms for savings and loans. Here we gave cameras to people and asked them to take pictures of where they keep their money. And we see under the mattress and some trousers and a cash box. It's estimated in Uganda alone there's 300 million US dollars saved in such places. With a grant from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, our goal was to build a platform so we could connect the mobile money and the banks and then work with the local banks to craft products to meet the needs of the rural poor. My product team in particular sought to understand our new customers in their own context so we could be sure to create products that truly help their needs. This is a look at planning a research trip. A look at my research kit. That's a lot of shillings to pay for participants and gas, food, and lodging, recording devices, a few different phones so I could check the screen experience and connectivity of the different telcos, our company car and driver, a look at life on the road from worse to better, a meal in a region where rice grows well. It's a lot of food on that plate. And this is now a business in a rural area in front of someone's home. So we can buy some produce. In that bucket with the blue cup are small dried fish. And in that jar on the right is cooking oil. So if I need some cooking oil for dinner, I can go buy one scoop and she'll ladle it into that bottle and I can take it home. This is also a business. Can you guess what this is? It's notebook paper folded up and glued into tiny envelopes and then sold to the local pharmacy for dispensing pills. I found in this new context that I needed new icons. In this hair salon, I was interviewing a participant and I had my conversation guide already written when I arrived and I asked this stylist, what inspired you to become a stylist? And the response I got back was, Huh? And it may be that the word inspired didn't translate well into her language, but really my question itself was ridiculous because I hadn't done my homework. If I had done my homework, I would have read up enough to know about the acts of violence that had occurred in Uganda and that she likely wasn't operating from a place of inspiration, but rather survival. And so this was one of my first lessons, that research before research is not optional, and I feel like this applies to our work in all contexts. It's our responsibility to research people and context before we start our research, even if we're in a hurry. This is a look at a method that we developed. So here we're trying to find out how do people earn and spend their money? And so I would ask a participant, how much did you earn last month? And then give them the play money to represent that. And then I had printed out pictures of the different expenses that I expected a family with a small farm to have. In this case, a farmer had put down money on all the pictures, but none on the cow. Yet I had seen in the backyard was one cow. And I asked him, can you tell me more why there's no money down on the cow? And he said, oh, yeah, you have a, a European cow, and I have a brown Ugandan cow. <laughs> <laughs> And so I learned another lesson, that it's really important to get the content right. And I think any of us that have created prototypes for user testing have experienced this reality. 
So we create a prototype to test some new flow only to have our participant get stuck on some detail that we didn't get quite right. And so I try to remember it's really important to get the content right. Now, we needed to know about people's income and expenses over time, but how do you answer such a question if your income varies greatly month to month, yet you have no tax returns or bank account or records? You may recognize this as a big whiteboard. For us, it became one of our favorite data collection tools. Oops. And this is how it works. So we drew a line for each month of the year and then asked the participant, draw for me a dot where you have the highest income, and then show me the next month, and so forth, and take us through all the months, and then do the same thing for your expenses. And so by um, traveling around and collecting this data in this way over time, we were able to overlay the data and, and arrive at some really great insights. Like in the fall, all the local, local loan cooperatives run out of cash at the same time that school fees are due. And at Christmas time, short-term credit is needed because people haven't yet sold the harvest from their farm, yet they need to start stocking up for Christmas. Through the experience of testing and creating these new methods, it occurred to me that all of the methods that we use were created by people like us. And that might seem silly to say, but I think it's a really important point. Even if we, it came in a beautifully hardbound textbook, it, we can still experiment it, try new methods, and even make our own, because we just might figure out a new great way to, make, to gather data. Now for a look at some ethnographic research participants. This woman sitting here at the sewing machine is working as a seamstress, and she has a shop with some soda and things for sale behind her. This woman is also working as a seamstress. She has a side business making bricks by hand to earn school fees for her family. This young woman has a business selling beans and small dried fish, and her dream is to sell bigger fish and make enough money to buy a metal roof for her house. Everywhere we went, there were groups of really um, excited and curious kids eager to hear what we were up to. Now, we were asking people about their incomes and expenses. We were already concerned that people might not want to talk to us about such private matters, much less with all of the neighborhood kids listening in. And so we created a role on our team called the distractor. <laughs> After some iteration, we figured out that Simon Says works really well. <laughs> This is a conversation probe, and here we're trying to find out how might a woman who seldom leaves her farm find out about new products or services. And here we've drawn different channels, so friends and family, a poster, the radio. And this helped us uh, facilitate conversations and learn how we might best market our new products and services. So for this work, our client was the local bank. And in the spirit of jobs to be done, our client thought that they were competing with the other banks to get to market first. Through this research, what we learned is that our bank was really competing with a cow. And so let's look at this from the perspective of a woman that can save 40,000 shillings a month for a year. If she puts it in a cow, at the end of the year, she'll have one and a half million shillings if it doesn't die. If she puts it in mobile money, she'll have all that money still at the end of the year. But if she puts it in my client's bank, at the end of the year, she'll be sad and surprised to see that much of her money's gone to pay for fees, because accounts in the bank have fees. It was one of the least comfortable experiences in my career to stand in front of a conference room of Ugandan bankers sharing a finding like this, but it was really influential in persuading them that we can't charge fees for this new emerging market. This was another finding I shared with them, and the question here is, who would you rather bank with? For synthesizing our findings, we used a framework called the five E's. Has anyone heard of this framework? A tiny sprinkling. Entice, enter, engage, exit, extend. It was really useful for reminding our client that we want to invest and think about the entire customer journey. It's pretty common for companies or product teams to focus really just on the engage piece and then save the other phases for other departments or later. But if you think about them all together, you can develop a more cohesive product experience. A look at a few findings. 
This is in the enter phase. And so my team sought to do some first person research and we split up and each opened a bank account at a different bank. At the bank I went to, um, I was told I needed to bring a photo even though there was a camera in between the teller and I. And I said, oh, can you take my picture with this camera? And he's like, oh, our camera's broken. So I went to the photo studio, got my photo taken. When it came time to print it out, I learned that the printer was out of ink. I'd have to come back tomorrow. Went back tomorrow, got my photo, went back to the bank. Then the bank told me, oh, we need a letter of recommendation from your manager. When I talked to customers, we learned that the paperwork was really intimidating to fill out and also that the amount they had to deposit uh, was less than the cost it would take for them to get to the bank and back. And so with these findings, we were able to illustrate our recommendations that the bank needs to offer free photography, pre-approved accounts with no requirement for a letter of recommendation, that they need to send agents to the village and help have them help with that paperwork. Back at the office, this is a look at ideation, a process called Creative Matrix, created by Lumet Institute. And so here we're ideating at the intersection of two concepts. So across the top, we had written ways to meet the customer need, like manifest trust, and along the side were different channels. And the way it works is the, you ideate at the intersection of the two. So how might we use partnerships to manifest trust? We took these discrete ideas and stitched them together using storyboards, and then iterated those storyboards into concept posters. Each concept poster has a catchy name, elevator pitch, how it works, and some key features. We then evaluated these concept posters using predetermined criteria, such as impact, cost, and difficulty. With those prioritized concepts, typically now I might um, illustrate some storyboards to bring to potential customers for their evaluation. And what I learned in this context is that uh, illustration is seen as juvenile, like comics. And so instead, my team created photographic storyboards, which was way more fun and faster, honestly, than illustrating. And so we took these concepts out to the field and talked to potential customers and asked for their help with refining our concepts. And then how many people have had a great design idea and then found out from the development team that it would cost too much? <laughs> that happened to us even with this simple phone. So where we wanted to put the menu it was gonna be too costly and we just had this gut feeling like, oh, that's just not intuitive, the cheap way is not intuitive. So we took the non-intuitive flow out to the field using uh, paper prototyping with this pink phone. Everyone kept asking if they could keep the pink phone. Um, and learned that the unintuitive way just wouldn't work for our customers. And that helped us to persuade our team that we needed to invest in the more intuitive design. The product we landed on is a savings, uh, savings product that encourages you to set a goal and then gives you warm um, reminders to do so. Because people have shocks that come up, needs that arise, it allows you to withdraw your money early and even apply for an emergency loan. And if you do succeed in saving for your target, you're rewarded with credit and prizes. We piloted our product with a branch bank. This is the manager teaching a cohort of customers about the product. In the pilot, we saw that the um, officers were writing some bit of information on scraps of paper, paper before the customer left. And we asked, oh, what are you writing? Oh, people need to know about next steps and who to call with a question. And so thus our customer card was born. And so um, here's the info about next steps. And then on the back was a nice place to write contact information. Some marketing materials, brochure, some media from our broader launch. And while my team's role has ended, the channels and products that we created live on. Uh, they really truly are uh, sustainable solutions that um, are benefiting both business and the end customer. As of a few years ago, the system serves more than 170,000 rural customers and is growing at a rate of 10,000 customers a month. Looking back, my biggest lesson is that relationships are really number one. The relationships my team built with our clients allowed us to um, pave the way for our work. And the warm and collaborative relationships I had with my colleagues really allowed us to get some tough work done. 
I put together a link if anyone's interested in doing work in the social good space. It's got some potential paid opportunities, some volunteer opportunities, and some different toolkits if you want to find a new method to try out in your own practice. Thank you.